Okay, it's nine o'clock. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second in the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting series. Um, we're just going to quickly run through um, some slides here. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps and the host of the meeting this morning for anybody who hasn't uh, met me in person or uh, had a conversation with me on Twitter. You're all very welcome. Um, we've got two, I think, widely different companies, but two very interesting companies presenting this morning. Just to give you an idea of the structure of the webinar, um, as I say, we've got two companies. they we present on a fortnightly basis. Each company gets 30 minutes with a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions for the presenter, please type them in the Q&A box. And then at the end of their presentation, we can uh, run through as many questions in the time allows. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel in due course, uh, probably Monday of next week by the time we finish editing. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, Coffee Microcaps, feel free to follow us on Twitter at C Microcaps. That's where we post most of our content, who's going to be on upcoming webinars uh, and any in-person conferences that may be happening once we get through this uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, LinkedIn as well for some of our additional uh, long form content. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Tim Slattery, CEO of APN Group. Tim, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks everyone for, uh, for tuning in this morning. Um, I'm also joined here by Mr. Joseph Durango, who's APN's Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so it's great to be talking with you today. For those of you that haven't uh, met me or Joseph or, or know too much about the group, I thought I'd just give you a very quick overview for a few minutes and run through, uh, I guess, our financials as well as some of the key products that we have across the group and wrapping up with you know, where we're positioned um, today vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 situation and the path forward. So at its simplest, APN Property Group is a specialist real estate investment manager. Um, all we do is commercial real estate, and that's all we've done since we set out in 1996, so over 20 years ago. So essentially what we do is we match commercial property investment opportunities with capital, uh, and that's all different sorts of capital, from a mum and dad investor having $1,000 to invest to some of Australia's largest superannuation funds, and even some um, global sovereign wealth funds um, we, we call our clients. On the other side, in terms of the different products you've got, on slide two, you'll get a, a reasonable sense of this, but we've got um, a series of different products that are all fit within that commercial property space. So we have some direct property um, syndicates, so a fund that will own just a single building, so a single office asset, a single industrial asset, or we have two of our own ASX listed REITs. So collectively, they have about $1.2, $1.3 billion of assets under management. So APN Industrial REIT, you may be familiar with that. The ASX code is ADI, and APN Convenience Retail REIT, which owns a, a portfolio of service stations that um, trades on the ASX under the code AQR, which you may be familiar with, as well as our Real Estate Securities Division, which has um, at balance date. So obviously, a few, a few things have changed since then, but at the balance, they'd have um, just over uh, $1.6 billion in assets under management, and that owns a diversified portfolio of listed property stocks. So that, that, that's really what we do. So we really generate our revenue from two sources. First, providing investment management services to all the funds um, that we manage. You can see this on slide two. And the second thing we do is we invest our management company's own equity alongside all of those Fund. So at the balance date, we have about $138 million of net tangible assets, uh, and we had $16 million of cash. So we believe the company remains very well capitalised through this current period of, um, of dislocation and market stress. So just touching on, I guess, some key financial metrics on slide three before I, I pass over to Joseph to run you through some of the more, more of the financials before we go through the funds. Um, our operating earnings, so we generated $6.4 million dollars um, for the half ending um, December uh, uh, December 19, 
So that was up uh, roughly a third on the prior corresponding period and generated over 98% of our income from recurring sources. Stat Street profit at $17.4 million. Uh, and our funds under management, which is a key performance indicator for us, increased $3.1 billion to uh, or $138 million over the half. We pay a distribution, which um, for the half year just gone has been an interim distribution of 1.6 cents per security. And our total security holder return for the last five years has been 22.3% per annum on, on average. So there's, there's a few key stats that we, we use as the management team to track the performance of the business. I'll now pass over to Joseph to go through some of our financials in a bit more detail on slide four. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. So turning to slide four and the results for the first half uh, continued to build on six successive years of sustained growth across the group. Uh, recurring income growth that uh, continues to outpace the compound annual growth in our funds under management as we continue to enhance our earnings and our grow and grow our co-investment model. Over this period as well, APD security holders saw a 22.3% per annum total return, while distributions increased from uh, 1.25 cents in FY2014, 2.75 cents for, to the end of uh, last financial year. Just turning over to the um, income statement, and, and APM delivered a strong operating earnings for, uh, growth for the first half. Uh, funds under management um, or funds management fees increased by 5% compared to the prior corresponding period, reflecting an underlying activity, uh, underlying activity across the group during the period uh, and growth in, in, those, um, in those activities. Importantly, it only recognises part of the fees generated um, from the additional assets acquired by both APN industrial REITs and APN convenience retail REITs uh, that are due to settle over the next uh, few months uh, this, uh, this calendar year. Um, Co-investment income increased 12% to $4 million in the half, which was comprising of distributions received from our co-investments, uh, predominantly in our APN Regional Property Fund, uh, and increased distributions from um, ADI, uh, Industrial REIT, and Convenience Retail REIT. Operating earnings increased about 33% to 2.03 cents per staple security. This was largely driven by changing the, the tax arrangements and, and lower employment costs in the first half. Uh, Non-operating activities totaled about $11 million, which comprised a 4.1 million gain in APM's co-investments in ADI and AQR, and the reversal of deferred tax liabilities as part of the stapling restructure. This was uh, partially offset by um, some business development costs, including stapling implementation uh, expenses of $500,000, uh, and importantly excluded from the business development costs are $400,000 in, in product development costs that are being incurred above the line, above the operating earnings line, uh, and include uh, in relation to new product development. Uh, moving on to the, the following slide, and as Tim touched on earlier in the presentation, um, APN is well positioned and, and well capitalised for future growth. We've got a relatively strong balance sheet with minimal debt and, and a healthy available cash position. Net tangible assets for the half had increased by 10% to $138 million or 43.4 cents per staple security. Uh, this was predominantly due to the reversal of some tax deferred liabilities as part of the, re the stapling restructure that occurred back in December uh, last year. In line with our co-investment model, we continue to maintain material stakes primarily in our listed funds. It is also important to note that the subsequent two funds, ADI and AQI, continue to perform uh, and, and be well positioned in, as income focused investment products um, in the current climate. I'll now hand over back to Tim, um, who will run through some of the operational highlights uh, across the group. Yeah, thanks. So uh, we're now on slide seven. So just to give you an overview of the, the products that we have, I mean, this, you'll see this moniker property for income uh, mentioned, with, you know, I guess in a recurring fashion through the deck. I and mean, that is a central investment philosophy that we have. So whenever we're investing, we're really looking at the fundamental drivers of the, the real estate product that we're looking at. So what does that mean? That means, well, uh, ultimately, what are the assets? Where are they? Who are the tenants? How well capitalised are they? 
you know, how strong are their business models, and how strong are their competitive positions, and then, you know, how much debt do the underlying um, stocks have or where and, and how are they managed, how strong are the management teams that we're, we're looking at and, and obviously which sectors are they in office, industrial, retail. So our funds, are, you know, we would say are, are, have been consistently managed at the conservative end of the, the spectrum. So that, what does that mean? That means that, yeah, typically we've tried to avoid um, stocks that um, in our real estate securities funds, which is you could think of like a fund of funds owning um, a, a range of the stocks in the, the ISX 200 property trust index. We tended to avoid stocks that have high funds management, um, earnings contributions, high development contributions, which are typically more volatile, and focusing on recurring income flows. So this business has, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, effectively started in 1996. The recent turmoil has definitely seen a decline in the unit price as a lot of the stock, the, the listed property stocks have been sold off heavily. Um, they have bounced significantly, and I guess it's really for us to, to, to keep uh, monitoring this strategy that we still see that property for income as a value proposition for clients is is going to be relevant we see a lot of pressure on income from you know people losing jobs a whole series of things um, pressure on retirement earnings. so we continue to believe that if we can generate strong cash based income focus returns from our real estate products we'll be in good position so the two other funds i just like to quickly mention on slide nine, APN Industrial Rate. So this fund, I guess, to give you a sense of how it's positioned here, so we have a weighted average list expire of 5.8 years. We have a portfolio of office and industrial tenants. Typically, they are larger office and industrial tenants. So here we have Westrack. They um, are the main distributor for Caterpillar, so the big bulldozers and infrastructure equipment that um, is servicing the, the New South Wales region. This fund has a gearing of below 30%. Um, it has a very attractive debt expired profile, so it's got, you know it's got a good good strong balance sheet position, and we'd see this fund very well placed to continue to deliver on its income uh, expectations from from investors in that that office and industrial space. I think similarly, you could if you track through to slide 11, and you can see APN convenience retail rate. So this is a service station portfolio. We'd see this as a non-discretionary uh, retail portfolio. So we think the basic items for day-to-day -day needs, including petrol, will continue to be sought after for a significant period of time. We have a weighted average to lease expire of 11 years. We have tenants, um, which include 7-Eleven, the BP, Caltex, Puma Energy, which uh, has, is in the process of being acquired by Chevron. So very strong tenants, long-term leases, relatively low gearing um, here at Balance State with 24.6%. So we'd see this fund also you know, well placed to continue to, to grow. On our direct funds, uh, you can see here, I mean, really our two listed rates are formed out of this direct property part of the business. We have four active funds for about $150 million. And we, can, we think that as we, we track through this COVID-19 situation that a lot of the opportunities that we will see will be in this direct property part of the business. We have been for a, a considerable period, so that's you know, several years, been more conservative than others have been in terms of their acquisition assumptions and the way that they've um, used debt to fund their acquisitions. So we would see this as not entirely, certainly not suggesting we saw a COVID-19 situation, but we're certainly not surprised to see a, a market dislocation and some stress coming back into the market. In some ways, we've been, um, you know, we've been sort of preparing for this period in the market to, to pick up some further acquisition opportunities. So on slide 14, you'll see we have you know, a significant um, portfolio, $1.4 billion of assets, and we're in the key sectors that we would see is we have very little in discretionary retail, so just $46 million out of $1.4 billion, and we have a you know, wet average lease expiry over seven years in occupancy at 98%. So the portfolio going into this is, is pretty well placed. And you can see, turning to slide 17, just to round things off, in terms of where, how we're positioned, I mean, a number of these, Specific metrics will be, I guess, have been outdated or superseded by the volatility we've seen in the financial markets since the start of this um, calendar year with COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Um, but what we what we continue to ha continue to have across the business is strong cash position and uh, the majority of our funds in a position where they can 
continue to pay solid distribution income, which is really the key value proposition for investors. Uh, just on the uh, on the following, I might just take you to slide 19 before we um, pass over to questions. This slide here is one way of giving you a sense of what you're buying when you're buying a share in or a security in, in APN Property Group. So what this does is it breaks down the split between all of our hard assets. So that's our co-investment. So you can see the stake in yeah, APN industrial rate, APN convenience retail rate, our cash, and then you can see what we've got in the implied valuation of the funds management business. So all these numbers are moving around a little bit at the moment, but you can see that at, at the balance state when we had a immaterially higher share price, security price, um, we still had a relatively conservative implied valuation for the funds management part of the business. If you're thinking you're at the business and it's too hard. So the assets, what you're buying on our balance sheet and then our, our funds management business there. So look, um, I might just close off uh, by, by saying on slide 20, we did for the first two months have a very strong start to the year. We saw a big bounce back in um, asset values, whereas in December we saw a tick down. Um, since then, we've seen quite a lot of volatility. We publish our securities business um, daily on our, our website. So I think we're currently down about $400 million in the context of a, a 32 billion dollar funds under management um, business that we, we we had as at the um, the end of February pro forma for the acquisition. So we certainly have an impact, but um, you've seen a very significant reduction in the, sh the current share price as well. So we think looking at the fundamentals of our business, we don't have a, any um, necessarily cast iron guarantees, but we certainly feel feel good that we're in a strong balance sheet position and our funds going into this um, situation um, were very well placed as far as the quality of the assets and quality of the balance sheets, which we think will um, stand us in good stead. So look, I might just thank you all for dialing in uh, or uh, tuning in now and uh, for your time again and pass back to Mark for any questions you may have. So thanks again. Okay, thanks, Tim and Joseph. Yeah, we've got uh, uh, one question here so far. How much short-term pressure do you see on rents and are there any particular concern areas within the APN managed portfolio? Not sure if Tim or if yeah, sure. Joseph, which, which is best to take that up. Okay, I can take that. Thanks, Mark. Um, look, it's a great question. It's a question on uh, everyone's mind. So, Look, the, the answer is that it does depend. I mean, it does depend a little bit about exactly which which assets we're we're talking about, which fund. As a whole, we think we're pretty well placed because we've got tenants that don't have a great deal of exposure to discretionary retail or um, the smaller office tenants as a you know as a whole. Um, we do have a couple of funds. So industrial rate would have probably 10% of its portfolio in smaller office. Tenants, so you know those those tenants may well be entitled to some rent relief under this tenancy code of conduct, but we have very little exposure across the portfolio, which is exposed to the you know the, the shopping centres per se. We have a bit in our, our listed funds, but um, if you look at slide 14, we've got really only 46 million dollars of, of retail, so that's really just one fund, which is about 22 million dollars, which is a Woolworth anchored um, shopping centre based in Coburg North, just north of um, Melbourne CBD. But again, we've got Woolworths there for over 60% of the rent, which we think will be, you know, be, they're actually, their, their turnover is up um, considerably as a result of this, but we've got a cafe and a gym. So those smaller tenants will certainly be affected by this. And I, I would see as being um, the recipients of some rental relief um, for how long it's, Hard to say, but in the scheme of our whole portfolio, you know, we've got relatively little exposure to um, tenants that will be, um, we think, will be to a point where they can't pay the rent. So that would be the answer to that one. Okay, we've got an, another one. It's a two-part question. It might be um, more for Joseph. Uh, what write-downs are likely to be necessary to asset values at June 30? And then also, how much cash does the A read fund have to participate in, I guess, some of the capital raisings that are going to be happening within within the broader A read market. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start off and then I'll, um, I'll hand over to Tim to, to answer that. So, in terms of um, expected write downs, I guess at this stage it's, um, uh, it's a bit early to tell. We've been in a, 
active discussions with uh, not just valuers but at banks and what the, the consistent message has been across the board is that subject to specific particular assets that are under pressure uh, and as Tim just alluded to earlier, um, our, our portfolio across the board is relatively well placed uh, given the, the type of tenants that we're exposed to are probably not as heavily impacted due to the, the restrictions and lockdowns as some other portfolios are. So uh, it's, a, it's still a bit early to tell um, uh, in, in terms of where we're going to start seeing write downs or, or, or um, devaluations um, in, in the portfolio, with which um, I think we're going to be well placed out of, uh, out of that. In terms of a, a cash position, the, um, the ARIC fund uh, uh, maintains as part of its mandate a minimum of, um, or a, a target of between 5 and 10% of cash. And it, uh, it's well placed at this point in time. Um, it's been actively, uh, the, the fund managers and the team have been actively monitoring your position and its sector weightings as, uh, as the whole situation has evolved. And uh, I feel that they're well placed to um, take advantage of uh, opportunities as they arise over the, over the short and medium term in that, uh, in that portfolio. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that one. But I think a couple of things that you know your listeners might be interested in is you know going into this, the the sector, the A sector was in much better balance sheet place than, than than where it was with the GFC. You know, much lower levels of debt. So our A REIT fund has definitely you know got you know it's sort of cashed up a little bit at the margin to make sure that if there are any equity raisings coming, it can participate. But the, the, I mean, the retail stocks have already been sold down a, you know, to, to a significant uh, level, so they've actually bounced back recently over the past couple of weeks. So I, I guess there's, there's that bit to it. And then in terms of write downs, look, it's it's very hard to know right now. I mean, you, you'd have to think that what's happened has got to be a negative for um, commercial real estate, but um, it's how much of a negative is pretty hard to say. So again, slide 14, we carry our our portfolio at a weighted average cap rate of 6.6%. So, you know, I think you've got a 10-year bond yield of less than 1% and a very sort of um, stimulatory central bank and fiscal, you know, I guess a fiscal stimulus um, regime at the Commonwealth uh, or the federal government level that's sort of providing as much support as it can. So it we, we didn't feel like we were holding our values at, a particularly high or uh, level going into this. So it, it may be very benign as far as any change in, in asset values across our portfolio uh, at, at June. That, that wouldn't surprise me me personally, but um, there's still probably a good couple of months to see how it plays out. So, uh, But I, for investors, I wouldn't necessarily be seeing, um, you know, waiting to see the huge reductions in um, in, in asset values. Um, that, that may not happen this time around for these types of assets. Okay, um, we got two more. Um, Chris, is this turmoil throwing up opportunities, and and how do you see the business growing from here? Is the first one. Um, yeah, look, we, we certainly do. I mean, the first order of business is obviously make sure that we're you know, right across everything that we we have in our business, which is which I'm, I'm you know, pleased to say we were you know, pretty well placed going into this and. But, but yes, then we definitely see this as a growth opportunity. We've said for a long time we'd like to think that we could grow our business at 10 to 15 percent per year in in, in annual growth at, at the funds under management level. And then when there is an event of dislocation, that's where we think that you know we can probably add more value. So where where are the opportunities? I think balance sheets will be key. So. If you've got a syndicator or a smaller property fund manager that's gone in with 60 or 65% gearing, then uh, I think that, that the ability to recapitalise those funds or for them to, to, to make it through in, in the same shape is, is going to be a lot harder than, you know, obviously funds that have got, you know, sub 30% gearing. So I think balance sheets are going to be um, a, an interesting, you know, obvious place to, to look. But yeah, certainly we see um, this as an opportunity for us to, to grow. But we'll be very judicious about how we do it we, we recognize how far cash can go once um you know when you do have a dislocation event like this so across the two rates that have got significant acquisition capacity and APN itself with you know it's 16 million dollars of cash at balance date we think we're pretty well placed to be able to pick up some assets at, at, at attractive prices yeah and I think that leads nicely into the next question is um how are you seeing property valuations in office slash industrial right now, I guess, have these dislocations presented themselves? 
Well, yeah, I guess on office and then industrial. Again, it really depends on what you're looking at. So um, a number of uh, participants on the call might have noticed that Dexas and GRC just signed a deal to buy, I think, a half stake in, in the Rialto um, building in, in it was five to five Collins Street. I think that was at a cap rate of 5%, maybe 5.25%. 5, 5. So you've got pretty recent transaction evidence, and I understand that that cap rate softened 25 basis points through the through the negotiation period, but that was all through the COVID-19 uh, evolution. So you'd say for that sort of asset at the moment, there's not a significant um, reduction, but it really depends on what happens with income levels. I mean, if, if the tenants in those buildings stay strong and the income stays strong, then you've got less of a chance to see, you know, cap rates blow out. If, on the other hand, you've got an asset that, you know, you've got a co-working operator or you've got someone that doesn't have a robust income to it, then I think on that sort of stuff, you'd be expecting to see cap rates move the other way. So quality of income will be a key differentiator. Um, on the industrial side, it probably depends a little bit about which industrial we're talking about, but certainly warehousing. I would expect to see that, you know, still continued demand for logistics and as online retail grows and, you know, there's more demand for, for warehousing space. What could change that? I guess the Aussie dollar moving around, if, if you know, if it became uncompetitive, to buy things from offshore or supply chain shut down, then that's going to mean that you know, buying locally sourced um, products is going to mean that industrial comes comes back a bit. But at the moment, we haven't really seen that. So we haven't seen industrial cap rates change greatly. But um, that's probably more at the um, high quality, sort of more institutional end uh, of the market. We'll have to see what happens with um, sort of smaller products or, or, or buildings that are more challenged. Um, I think across the board there'll be a, a, there'll certainly be less um, demand and less growth coming out for new tenants. So if you've got vacant buildings, I think they'll certainly be um, be put under some pressure. Okay. All right, Tim Joseph. Listen, thank you very much for that. Um, our time is just about up. We're going to move on to the the second presenter. Um, we now have Mr. Ronald Van der Plum, um, CEO of. PKS Holdings, who is our second presenter on the webinar today. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everybody. What I would like to do today is give you an overview of PKS Holdings Limited, um, including taking you through an acquisition that um, we've done, we announced two days ago. My name is Ron Vendeplum. I'm the CEO of PKS. I've been the CEO for about a year. Before that, I worked in um, always in the healthcare industry for large multinational companies such as Novartis and, and Activists, um, as well as some smaller companies, as well as some listed companies. One of them you might know is, um, is Viralytics. What I would like to do today is, first of all, take you to an overview of PKS, um, spend some time on the growth strategies, and then um, go into more detail about the acquisition of Pavilion Health. So PKS is a healthcare technology company. We've got a product, a clinical decision support product called RippleDown, that basically, if you think about it, it's a, it's a rule engine that automates the human decision-making process in, in healthcare organizations. Um, it can be used for other industries as well. However, we, we want to focus on healthcare only. There's two components to it. One is called Auditor, that helps the financial departments in healthcare organization, and one is Expert, which basically helps the specialist, the pathologist, um, with faster pa patient throughput, um, as well as better patient outcomes. It's a product that's been implemented successfully globally. And I think why, why there's so much, um, well, basically, the technology itself has been very highly regarded. That's why we've got three uh, international partnerships with leading international healthcare companies, which is um, Philips, Thermo Fisher, and Abbott. It's a world-class um, healthcare technology. And the reason why I'm saying that is that if you, there's many rule engineers around. Um, this one has got some very particular features, like most rule engines are sequential, which means the more rules you write, the, um, the slower it becomes. Um, but we've got more like a, a decision tree or a ripple down effect. So it actually normally doesn't slow down the, the technology or the rule engine itself, not even when we got tens of, tens of thousands of rules actually in there. The most unique part, though, is that the users themselves actually write the rules. So the expert themselves write the rules. You don't have to go to an IT department. And it's normally we, we train the people to do that. And after one or two days, you'll be 
you know how to actually write the rules. Um, it's basically like it's a, a structured, basically English syntax language, how you can actually write those rules. The other part to the whole software is as well that there's all mechanisms in place to make sure that the rules are actually correct so that it doesn't contradict any of the other rules written. And so you get a very strong rule engine as such. It's very scalable. Um, I touched on before on the global partnerships where, um, for instance, a company like Abbott, which is our most recent one, sells our software under their own um, brand, which is called LNRQ CDS. And it's a large market. I mean, clinical decision support is a growing part in the healthcare industry uh, because every healthcare organization has to become more efficient and making sure that they can actually use the data in the right way to, to actually get better patient outcomes. We've got a strong financial profile. I mean, the company has been profitable for a long time. We had EBITDA margins over 50% last year. And so it's actually throwing off cash as well. And we've got a very experienced team, management team and board of directors. What you see in all healthcare organizations, basically in all organizations, is that there's an increase of financial pressure. You have to do more with less. Patient volumes are increasing, but importantly as well as the patient outcomes or the patients actually demanding um, better outcomes of, of their, for their health and taking care of that, um, as well as succession risk. We in particular focus on pathology labs, where a senior pathologist would have minimal 15 years experience, and if you can capture part of that knowledge into a rule engine, um, it makes the organization going forward much stronger. I mentioned before, we have two parts to it, Ripple Down Auditor and Ripple Down Expert. Auditor helps the financial department in healthcare organizations. When we go into a pathology lab and we look at the billing, um, it's mainly a manual process. And many of those claims that they put through with Medicare are actually incorrect and percentages are here over sometimes over 15 percent so what we do we actually check the claim before it's actually been submitted so people can actually or we can make sure that the information is correct and you don't have to go back later to make to actually adjust it which is a very long and cumbersome process of doing um, so it's, it makes the whole organization much more efficient um, and you and you get your money back quicker as well the real um, part or clinical decision support part is in the expert part. And that's where we capture the clinician's experience or expertise into the rule engine. And so the, in this case, the pathologist would actually write the rules themselves and it prevents them or basically doesn't, it's not necessary for them to later on check the results of those outcomes anymore. If that case has been there before and it's exactly the same outcome, we apply the rule to it and there will be a much more detailed comment going back to the GP. And that provides, that provides better patient outcomes as well. An example I can give you is like, normally if there's no rule engine, you get your cholesterol tested, it states high cholesterol, that will go back straight to the doctor. The doctor sees high cholesterol and gives you a script. We can write the rule that looks back in the historical results for the patient as well. And if we saw that there was high cholesterol the year before and the year before that as well, and we see in his notes that he's actually on cholesterol lower medication, um, it's not so much that he's got high cholesterol, but more that he doesn't take the medication. So the rule that, or basically the outcome that will go back to the GP states, um, high cholesterol has been on high cholesterol or has high cholesterol for many years, seems to be not taking his medication. So it's a different decision or basically discussion for the GP to have to see what the issue is, why the patient doesn't take any medication. Although we are a smaller company, we have got sales worldwide. Um, it's, it's very pleasing to see that we've actually got sales all around the world, and which is, I think, a, a real big achievement as well for a smaller company. We do partly of that direct, like in South Africa, um, we've got a very big customer in, in Lancet, and of course, part through our channel partnership with Thermo Fisher, um, Abbott and Philips. The company listed about it's less than a year ago, and it was really about growing the company. And we want to do that, of course, to focus on our um, channel partners, in particular Abbott, who sells our product under their own name. And we're working very closely with them because Abbott has got good relations with most healthcare organizations around the world and help them to actually try to convert their customers um, from potential lead into commercial organizations. And that is going really well where Abbott is picking up many new customers. 
as you can understand at the moment, it has slowed down, although they're still signing up new customers at, uh, even with the whole COVID crisis. We're looking at potential new channel partners as well. Can we work with other companies through different models? And we're thinking here about companies that, for instance, build the big software systems for laboratories, the laboratory information systems, like a Meditech, can we work with them to get our software in there? We have started the direct sales model again. Um, Abbott had, for the first few years when, they, when we signed an agreement with an exclusivity, um, that has now expired. So we're looking at our, or we've implemented our own sales team, looking at opportunities, not only in pathology, but in particular also in a much wider hospital market. As I mentioned before, our product is a rule engine. And so it can be used not only in pathology, but also in a much wider hospital market. We're also looking at how we can actually further advance our product, in particular with um, machine learning, as well as a cloud strategy. Naturally, as every company will do it, look at certain price increases. And we've always had a strategy of selective acquisition to see where we can, if we can acquire complementary businesses that have turned over, that would add benefit to our organization as such. And that's one I would like to spend a little bit more time on at the moment, um, because two days ago we um, announced the acquisition of Pavilion Health. Pavilion Health is a market leading provider of SAS audit and risk management software, and they sell it primarily to hospitals and governing health bodies. Um, the acquisition that we did was an all script deal, so no cash, no debt, where post the acquisition, the pavilion shareholders will end up with 35% of the capital. And if we look at um, the value of that, we, on the share price of last Friday, which was 13 cents, it would value the pavilion business as an enterprise value of $8.5 million, which is about 1.9 times sales or five times operational EBITDA. So it's a good, it's a good acquisition from that as well. And the main benefits, of course, are skill. Uh, we're doubling the size of our business. Our customers, we getting more customers, but in particular the customers we're after as well, or the, the, the relationships there, which for us are hospitals. And technology, by roadmap, we can actually do much more both in hospital and pathology. And another pleasing part is that we bolster the expertise of the whole technology, but also the executive team. Um, all three senior executives and owners of Pavilion Health will actually come over to PKS. As it is a non-cash acquisition, the cash that PKS had at the end of last year, which was just over $4 million, and we're still throwing off cash as well, can actually be used to further develop the combined business. I went before through our products, which are Ripple Down Auditor and Ripple Down Expert. Pavilion Health has got two main products called Pick and Risk. PIC is their auditing tool, which is very similar to our Ripple Down Auditor, uh, but then in the hospital setting, where they, they make sure that the data that is actually being submitted for claims with the healthcare funds is actually right, and so there's no issues with the actual billing. One of the products I'm really enthusiastic about is their risk product. It's a newer product. Pavilion Health gets all the hospital data overnight from all the hospitals they're working with in an anonymized fashion or in an anonymous way, and they will actually keep the data. And they will use the data to actually do analysis on it. And their risk product in particular does um, benchmarking of hospital acquired diseases. Uh, normally hospitals don't get reimbursed if somebody gets a disease or a complication within the hospital. And this product is actually used to benchmark various, various hospitals against each other so they can actually learn from each other and improve the processes there. They also, they have um, some advisory services. That's how they normally work, where um, they would put a consultant into a hospital, helping them with the billing, and will that move normally on to implementing their software within the hospital. The, um, the future roadmap is really to look at the unified platform. If we look at um, the risk product and we put our ripple down rule engine in front of that, it will be much easier to write a lot of rules around the analysis of what needed to be done. Um, but the very exciting part for me as well is the computer-aided coding. Similar to what I said before in pathology, in hospital, most of the invoicing is also done manually. Um, it's a very cumbersome and expensive process where you take the discharge notes, read through it, and then give certain codes what is actually being done, and that is actually being um, invoiced. 
with our rule engine and their um, coding products, we can actually automate part of the process, which will um, increase efficiencies and also leads to enormous cost savings in hospitals. So I think that's, that's a, a, a very strong way forward for us to put the two products and the two companies together. As you can he see here, with both PKS and Pathelion, I've got like very blue chip customers, not only in Australia, uh, but also worldwide for us, for PKS, of course, Abbott, Thermo Fisher, Philips, Lancet in, in South Africa. And for Pavilion, they've got many of the major hospitals in Australia, as well as the Ministry of Health in Ireland, Ministry of Health in Singapore. Um, they work with Qatar, so quite an international flavor to the company as well. If we then look at when we put the two companies together, what that means, PKS gets access to the established hospital relations. Um, Pavilion actually uh, has got 55% penetration of the annual 11 million patient separations, and it's both in public and private. Um, so very strong relationship with the hospitals there, which we can use to actually um, enter that market in an easier way. On the other hand, we've got relationships with the channel party, with the channel parties, and they can potentially be used to use the, their products into the wider international markets. The valuable client and industry data, what I mentioned before, for me, that is a real upside in the data that they own and the risk analysis product. At this stage, there is very limited pathology data in there, and that's where our expertise can actually, or our relationships with pathology actually can come in to make the data set even more valuable. Pavilion has got all their products into the cloud. So again, that's, a, that's an area we want to move into as well. So we can actually use that. And what I said before, by combining the roadmaps of both companies, we can come up with many more applications. So it's really a platform for growth as well, not only here in the Australian market, but also internationally, because um, Pavilion Health has got 100% of the public hospital market in Ireland, as well as Singapore. So that's a real strong way forward. So the, the, the real benefits or the synergies from this acquisition come from the complementary products, like we can actually offer our products to, to reviewing customers, reviewing customers to our products. Uh, so the cross-selling there, we get access to the hospital market, as well as access to pathology data for the, for the risk product. And it is very, the, the, for me, the upsides are really in further improving the risk product, but also the automated coding, which I think are enormous opportunities within the combined business. We can also further establish in the international markets. And what I said, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that basically the whole pavilion team will stay with the company. And so it will really bolster the expertise in the company as well. Um, the acquisition itself would be subject to shareholder approval. It's on a cash-free, debt-free basis. Uh, we've got 65 million shares being issued, which will be post acquisition 35%, and are subject to volunteer escrow periods of up to 24 months. Um, what we've done as well to make sure that the company starts operating as one company from day one is there's an incentive for the three um, executives that are coming over where 4 million performance shares can be split between them if sales in the next financial year, so 2021, will be over $9 million. So again, what we've tried to achieve here is that there will be no um, our technology and their technology, it will be one technology, and it will be combined opportunities to actually further develop the business. This will be the pro forma combined P&L. Um, and if we look at 2019, the last audited figures, full year figures, PKS had sales of around 3.9 or 3.85 million. It would have grown 113% to 8.21. The operational EBITDA at 3.81 million out of debt is still a very strong EBITDA. And the recurring revenue is around 70% of total business. So quite a, a defensive business that way as well. I mentioned before, we've got a very strong board of directors, um, people that have taken many companies public uh, and grown those companies, uh, as well as people with industry experience. We've got people like Paul Williams on the board, who was the CIO for HealthScope for many years. Um, so a strong board of directors in there and a very supportive board of directors that are quite heavily um, involved in the business. And this would be the management team um, going forward, where Doug Henry, the current managing director of Pavilion, will become the COO. Paul Connor will focus on all commercialization, and Mike Pollard will be the the CTO, so a very combined business that way as well. I said before that, that there is no cash transaction, so the um, 
the executives actually end up with quite a big share of the post um, acquisition company where the three executives were owned close to 22 percent uh, the fact that they've taken everything in shares shows as well the basically the belief in the in the combined company going forward if we then add the PKS board to that close to 30 percent of the shares is directly controlled by people by people directly working in the business uh, about 20 percent is by institutions and the rest is um, is free floating that brings me to the end of the presentation so if there's any questions i'm very happy to um to take those thank you uh, thank you ron uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come true i guess one is um who are the direct competitors to pks and then another one what is your estimate of pks's market share but the uh, question doesn't allude to in which market you know australia South Africa, wherever, but maybe just maybe outline the direct competitors. So the direct, there is, um, although there's other rule engines, what I said before, not many rule engines have got the technology what we've done. Um, and it's not specifically more developed for the healthcare industry. There is the bigger hospital and laboratory information systems, companies like a Cerner, an Epic, they, they say that they've got clinical decision support in their system but it is normally not a very straightforward clinical support and they can't decision support and they cannot really offer what we do. The, and I'll give you an example. We're very close of signing one agreement with, with in Australia here with one of the public um, pathology laboratories that has implemented the big, Cerner, the big Cerner laboratory information system and came to the conclusion that the system cannot offer what we can offer. So we are now very close in signing the agreement with them where we're going back with them in the Cerner system to put our product in there. As far as I'm aware, there's, I, I'm not aware of any systems that actually can easily, where the users can easily write their rules. Um, so the main competitors would be, for me, would be basically people don't need to use a product like this. Uh, and there's some companies that actually try to build something like this themselves, which is hard to do if you take that there's probably a hundred years of programming time being used to actually develop this product um, but sonic for instance as a company um, looked at our product and they developed something similar as in the clinical decision support um, without the flexibility so they're actually writing the rules which they and they hard coding them which they can do because it's actually within their own organization Okay, and then the, the next one, Ron, is um, for the combined group, um, I think this is kind of related to your point about, you know, the direct sales team, you know, working, I guess, in conjunction with Abbott, you know, how much of the cost base is going to be related to sales and marketing now that you've got Pavilion Direct plus Abbott? So at, at the moment, um, it is really, this acquisition... What we've done is to put the two companies together is to grow the company and um, this is not something that where we're really looking at saving costs so but because we both already have sales and business development resources in the company uh, i don't expect or don't we have not forecasted any significant or any increases basically in our expenses so by putting the two companies together yes there will be some cost savings in, in things like rent but the teams will both stay together, but can work on more than one product at the moment. So there will be no real increases in cost there. Okay. And then I think you kind of alluded to in your presentation, but uh, are you able to provide an estimate of revenue for PKS and FY20? The, for, for, for year 20, I think our revenue will come in pretty flat on last year. And the reason is that we... It, a lot of the um, parts what we actually put in place where we did the business development has been put on hold. So it's basically the delay of a lot of the opportunities that we're working on because uh, no, you, it's impossible to basically meet people at the moment to finalize things. And it's also very hard, of course, to train and implement software at the moment. And uh, we've got, we still have time around, so we've got two more. What are the competitors to... I guess the risk product that's coming across with Pavilion, you know, who competes exactly with that product head on? Um, so there, there's other data analysis products that, um, that are available. The benefit of Pavilion is that they actually 
own or have on their servers all the data out of hospitals. What I said in my presentation, 55% of all hospital separations in Australia, 100% of all hospital, public hospital separations in Ireland are actually sitting on their servers. And they can actually use that data to, to run the analysis. So the, the upside is much more in the data that they can use compared to the actual product that they can use. Okay. And then the final question, I think we'll leave it after this one. Um, question on the product revenue. Why is the recurring product revenue run rate for Pavilion declined in the, in the first half of FY20? And that has to do with one particular overseas assignment where they did the consultancy project. They, part of that was actually in recurring revenue. They believed that, that that was their tools, basically, that they pick and their risk product. They believed that it would go ahead uh, when the consultancy project actually came to an end. They, because of the whole COVID crisis, that was put on hold. And so that there's no income at, coming at the moment that has been postponed till next year. Okay. And sorry, if we can squeeze one last question in. Um, Definitely. Uh, how long do you see the hospital belt tightening lasting and you know, what is the effect of that on potential new contracts? Um, so if I look from, from our, both our business at the moment, the, there is no real decline in revenue. Most of uh, a part of our contracts, especially with the private op operators, are fixed price contracts. And so there's no real implication on the volume. Public hospitals normally do more at the moment. So there's actually a slight increase. So from that point, the, the underlying business is continues as it is. The where what I said before, where we see difficulties is is actually implementing and building up new customers at the moment, which goes at a much slower rate than normal. If we look at the first half of um, of this financial year, um, we put in ten new installations between Abbott and ourselves, and that will be a much lower number in the second half of the year. I believe that hospitals will open up soon again. And, there, and I believe that there will be even more need then to actually automate processes because the, uh, there's a lot of backlog in there. So I would say that by the beginning of next financial year, and the situation will be back to, to a normal situation for us where we can grow the company again. Yes. Ron, thank you very much for your time. I think we're going to leave um, questions there as we're approaching the the 10 a.m. mark. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and we'll see you again on Thursday, May the 7th, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. with uh, two more companies. and I'll advertise those um, once everybody is locked in and scheduled in. So thank you to Ron and thank you for everyone who tuned in today. Thank you.